I want to thank God for each one of you all being here today. And I want all of the fathers in the house to rise to your feet. Look at these, look at these brothers. We got some blessed brothers in this house. Come on. Come on, rise to your feet and stick your chest out. <laughs> Come on, get a lot of hand of praise for these fathers. Hallelujah. Yeah. We listen, guys. We have some good men in this church. And we have some outstanding fathers in this assembly. So I thank God uh, for each one of you all. We're going to get ready to uh, go to our scripture uh, text. And as, as, my, as a matter of fact, turn to the 129th number, number, <laughs> the 127th number of Psalms. And we're going to begin our reading at verse 1. And as we go, I want to just read a, a list of couple of thank you. First of all, uh, I want to thank you guys for being a caring and loving and supporting church. Just a couple of Saturdays ago, there was a funeral held here at the church, and the individual, uh, the wife and the individual that died were not members of this church, uh, but uh, they asked to, to hold a service here. And we, uh, as a matter of fact, the young lady uh, used to come to Bible study on a weekly basis here uh, several years back, and so we allowed them to utilize the church uh, to have this funeral service. Uh, but uh, she wrote a thank you letter, and I left it in the truck, but I'm, 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 I think my memory is good enough to, to summarize what she said. She says, thank you to EBC. And she said, Pastor Adam, thank you for your staff. She said, the staff? I thought to myself, my staff? What are you talking about? The ushers were serving. The sound team was serving. And they make the family feel welcome. And uh, Brother Rob was... Uh, helping conduct the pulpit and making sure that the guest minister had everything that she needed. So all those EBC servants came together to serve uh, a family that was not a member of this church. And I think that says something about the spirit uh, of, of the people in this church. I didn't hear one usher say, why we got an usher? They ain't our member. Not, not one of them said that, but they showed up in numbers, sound team, uh, Brother Rod and others who helped to carry out that. So I want to thank EBC for having uh, that big of a heart, amen, to, to really just do that. That's awesome, amen. I want to read something else to you. On August the 30th, 2013, I felt as if my life changed for the worse. The unthinkable and unimaginable happened to me at the tender age of 12 years old. Yet here I am writing this with as much sincerity as possible. In situations like mine, I've seen where kids my age could have, could have and would have taken the wrong road. But with a church family like this and with a God that keeps you and sustains you like he has done for me, how could I? I am living proof that God can turn a bad situation around and use it for my good. In this case, the death of my mother only further motivated me to do what is right. With all of this being said to my church family, my EBC church family, to Pastor Adams and First Lady, I sincerely say thank you for being there through good times and bad. As a graduate of Benton High School, class of 2019, I can say this is not the end, but the beginning for me with nothing but love. And that was from Brother Christian Thomas. And thank you, Christian, for that, that letter of thank you. I want, to, I want to read that because sometimes you don't realize what type of impact you're having on people's lives. And, and, I, and God is all about relationships. Everybody say relationships. God, we're going to even see in the scripture text today, brought the family together to, uh, to do what he wanted done in the earth realm. And families are all about what? Relationship. And so on this Father's Day, I thought we would take a little different turn and talk about the blessing of fatherhood. Everybody say the blessing of fatherhood. So many times, uh, you know, uh, fathers can get uh, a bad rap, I think. Uh, so many times we don't necessarily see uh, and, and appreciate what God is doing through dads, through fathers. And so uh, I want to share some things with you, and hopefully we'll be able to get, get it done today. If we don't get it done today, we get half of today and half of it next Sunday, because next Sunday is Men's Sunday. Amen? It's G-Men Sunday. And so my, my goal is, is to try to get it all today, but if I don't get it all today, amen, y'all just bear with me, okay? Can I get a witness? Brother Bubba Henry Mo, good to see you there, brother. God is good, Amen. We've been praying for you. Absolutely have. Listen, uh, 
Psalms 127. Start at verse number one, if you will, with me. Come on, we're going to read and we're going to go through here. Guys, let's walk through the scripture. Let's see what God says about the blessing of fatherhood. Let's see what God says about the family and how he uses the family unit uh, to get his will done in the earth realm. He uses the family unit to bless the church and the church to bless the community. Amen? And so we look at this in Psalms 127, verse number one says, A song for pilgrims ascending to Jerusalem. A Psalm of Solomon. Unless the Lord, what? Builds a house, the work of the builders, what? Is wasted. Unless the Lord protects a city, guarding it with centuries will do no good. It is useless for you to work so hard from early morning until late at night, anxiously working for food to eat. For God gives rest to his loved ones. Verse number three says, children are a gift from the Lord. They are a reward from him. Verse number four, now back up and read verse three again. Let's read one more time. Sometimes we need to understand this. When, 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 when that child is screaming at three o'clock in the morning wanting to bottle, amen, or when that child is being bratted and you got the discipline, sometimes we don't realize this, that children are a what? Gift from the Lord. They are a what? Reward from him. Look at verse number four. It says this, children born to a young man are like arrows in a warrior's hand. I like that. Verse 5 says what? How joyful is the man whose quiver is what? Full of them. He will not be put to shame when he confronts his accusers at the city's gates. Amen? Talking about the blessing of the Father. Go to Ephesians, the sixth chapter, and we'll begin our reading at verse number one there, and we'll go down through verse number four. Ephesians chapter six, verse number one, and uh, we'll read down to verse number four. Children... Obey your parents because you belong to the Lord. For this is the right thing to do. Next verse. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise attached to it. Can I put that on there? The first promise with a uh, first commandment with a promise attached to it. Verse number three says this. What's the promise? If you honor your father and mother, guess what? Things will go well for you, and you will have a long life on the earth. Right now, listen. Uh, back up to that verse one more time. I could also read this this way, and it would be an accurate assessment. If you don't honor your father and mother, things won't go well with you, and you won't have a long life on earth. Could we could, could we make that assessment? Because if you do it, you have it. If you don't, you won't. All right. Verse number four. Come on, let's read it. Fathers, oh fathers, fathers, oh fathers. Can I call you father? fathers? Fathers. I don't hear y'all. Fathers. All right. Do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. Rather, bring them up with the discipline and instruction that comes, what? From the Lord. Amen? Don't provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. Rather, bring them up with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. Now, as we get back to Psalms 127, as I begin to share the blessing of Father, do not go to sleep on me, ladies. Because the principles that are borne out through the scripture text are applicable to not only men, but to women also. Are y'all listening to me today? And so when we get back here to Psalms 127, which is our taking off point, uh, we see something right here. This psalm, this particular psalm, uh, was one that was written by Solomon. And we know that in Ecclesiastes, the book of Ecclesiastes, Solomon had stressed, he had stressed the crucial point that life is empty and meaningless without God there. He said life is empty and meaningless without God in your life. The wisest, the richest, and most powerful man of his time, talking about Solomon, Israel's king, Solomon, shocked his readers when he said that. Because basically he says, in spite of everything that I've learned, in spite of everything that I've done, in spite of all of the possessions that I have, in spite of all of the achievements that I have, I don't like life. 
I got a big house. Let me, let me bring it to modern day terms. I got a Benz and a Lexus in the driveway. I'm staying in a gated community with a 5,000 square foot house. My, my son is a doctor. My daughter is a lawyer. Uh, my other son, I mean, is a professional football player. My other, my other daughter uh, uh, teaches school. My children are doing well. I've been married to the same woman for 30 years, 40 years, but I don't like life. That's basically what Solomon was saying. He, had, he was the richest man on earth. And how many of y'all know money can't make you happy? Can I get one witness up in here? Ha now listen, having money in and of itself is not the, the, the pathway to happiness. There are many people who have money who are miserable. And Solomon had it all. Solomon had women. And let me tell you something, just having women won't make you happy, brothers. I said brothers. I said brothers. Having a bunch of women Come on. Having a bunch of concubines, and Solomon had a bunch of them, didn't he? Having women and having sex every day won't make you happy. I didn't get one amen on that. I hear some brothers right there, let me try it, Pastor. Let me try it. Solomon was it? 300 wives and 700 concubines or vice versa. He had all these women and yet he says life is vain. <laughs> Are y'all tracking with me today? He had everything that the world had to offer, all the pleasures, all the possessions, all the power, but none of them brought lasting fulfillment to him. His life was empty and meaningless because he had forsaken and ignored God. Now in Psalms 127, Solomon echoes the message of Ecclesiastes. He, 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 he highlights three major priorities in most men's lives. Number one, building a house or a family. Number two, protecting that family. And number three, uh, 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 working hard to provide for that family. I'm going to repeat those again. He, he, this psalm highlights three major priorities that's in most men's life. Building a house or a family protecting that family and surrounding community and working hard to provide for the family. Can I, can I get a witness? Is that something that most men ascribe to do? Amen? And Solomon emphasized that all are in vain without the Lord. Now, now, again, when we look at this passage right here, it's written from the perspective of man for men, but the message of this psalm is true for men and women alike. Okay, So, so don't forget that. Again, women don't go to sleep on them today. Psalms 127 is the first psalm, what they call it, there's, there's something that's called the Psalms of Ascent. Everybody say Ascent. In this psalm right here, number 127, it's the first of two of the Psalms of Ascent that stress the importance of the home and the family. Now, but Pastor, what, what is the Psalm of Ascent? So in, in Psalms 120 through 134 are known as the Psalms of Ascent. Another word for a psalm is what? A psalm. And the city of Jerusalem, if you know anything about geography, is situated high on a hill, okay? And Jews who were traveling to Jerusalem for one of the three main annual uh, festivals, Jewish festivals, traditionally sang songs on the way up to Jerusalem. So that's why they called the songs of ascent. While they were on their way up to Jerusalem, they began to sing these songs that are laid out in Psalms 120 through Psalms 134. Are y'all listening to me today, Okay. And so, so but, but, but again, when you look at this, uh, the Holy Spirit is, is, is writing this and, and giving the words uh, for these songs here because uh, the Holy Spirit right here, this, one, this 127th number of Psalms was positioned as the eighth number of the 15 ascent Psalms. Y'all got that? So in other words, there was, there was how many of them? 15? And number eight right here is, is 127, which is slap dab in the middle of the ascent Psalms. I don't think that was by accident. It's right in the middle because this 127th Psalm deal with the importance and the centrality of the home. Anything that we do, church-wise, government-wise, if the home is a wreck, all those other things are going to be a wreck. Can I get a witness? 
That's why, guys, listen, that's why we, we harp on and we invest a lot of time and money on building a marital relationship so that the marital relationship can build a strong family. Because if the families are not strong, guess what? The church will not be strong. It's hard to praise God. It's hard to get involved with kingdom work when you got hell at home. Oh, come on, look at me. Don't look at me like that. When it's hell at home, come on now. You, you, you can come in here and you be crying and stuff and people think the Holy Ghost, but you ain't crying because it's the Holy Ghost. You're crying because you're miserable at home. Anybody ever came to church miserable? Married but miserable? Huh? Or maybe you're, you're single, widowed, or divorced, whatever, but you, and you're still miserable. You ain't got nobody there with you. You're, you're miserable by yourself. If the home is not right, it affects all of the other institutions in society. That's why the enemy comes hard after the home. He comes hard after the marital relationship. He comes hard after the relationship between parents and children because he knows if I can mess the home up, then I can mess up God's plan for society. Can I get a witness? Y'all know the story, how it was, even back in Genesis, he came to, to, to bring division in the home, but, but what, hap what happened in that situation was we have a man, Adam, who, who did not reject passivity, as we learned that kingdom men ought to do, and he yielded to the influence of his wife and ate of the tree. Can I get a witness? And so, as a result... Satan came to attack the, fa the first family unit, and he's been attacking the family unit ever since. So this 127 number psalm deals with the, uh, the, the, the home. Amen. And again, for the most part, guys, y'all know this true. Men and women today spend their lives building homes and families, trying to protect them, amen, working to provide for them, okay? Yet at the end of the day, a good number of families are falling apart, and they're empty on the inside. In, the, in, in, in time, the marriages start to crumble. In time, the families start to fall apart. And everything they have worked for seems to vanish because somebody left God out. I want to tell you something. Marriage cannot be truly uh, at its highest essence and peak if you don't have God in the middle of it. The Bible says this, a three-stranded cord is not easily what? Broken. And when it's you, if it's just only husband and wife in the relationship and God is left out, that relationship can be more easily broken than it can if God is in the middle of it. Everybody said the blessing of fatherhood. Now, now, now let's kind of walk down through it. And I gave you a little outline here. Uh, the first thing we want to make a note of is don't build your house or don't build your home without the Lord. Touch your neighbor and say, neighbor, don't try to build a home without the Lord. The first thing, again, look at what happens. Building a house or a family without the Lord results in a weak base. And only he can give a firm foundation. Now, watch this. Only he can give a firm foundation. Foundation is critically important, y'all. Uh, again, I remember, most of y'all know I used to work in banking for 17 years. And I remember, uh, I remember very vividly when they were building, I used to work in, uh, it's called Commercial National Bank Towers, now Regions Tower downtown which is the tallest building in downtown Shreveport. And I can remember when they were building that, that, that tower. This is several years ago. And, and I drove down Texas Street where that tower is located. And while they were building it, they, they went deep down into the ground before they started coming up below the surface. And deep down into that ground, in that open pit, there was a lot of steel rebar, amen, in the foundation of the building. Because you can't build a, what, 26, 27-story tower and have a faulty foundation. Over a period of time, as the earth moves and shifts, it's going to end up tilting and cracking if the foundation is not right. And guys, I'm going to tell you something. Some of us, amen, have done the, a, 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 a poor job of building a solid foundation for our families. Do you not realize that most people will spend tons of money on a wedding? Hear me, hear, hear, y'all hear me carefully. We'll spend ton, tons of money on a wedding and, and little to no money on preparing for marriage. Spend tons of money on dresses, gowns, tuxedos, receptions, food. Any of y'all have to pay for that anymore? Anybody have to pay for a wedding here lately? 
Yeah, I, I know you two have, right? All right, and, and or your mom and daddies have, okay? All right. I know y'all, 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 y'all getting there, y'all, on, y'all on the pathway, amen. But but it costs a whole lot of money. But you, you, we are foolish to spend all that money and time looking pretty, having a nice wedding, beautiful pictures, videos, and all that. But yet we fail to spend any quality time, any measurable time, pouring into the foundation of the marital relationship. And as a result, we have marriages cracking all across this country because of no, no solid foundation. Are y'all with me? So building a house without the Lord, trying to build a family without the Lord is going to result in a weak base. And only God can give a firm foundation. Now, when the, when the remnant returned to Jerusalem, uh, few houses were available. And, and as the men labored to build dwellings for their families as they're coming back home, this psalm exhorted them to build their homes on a firm spiritual foundation just like they built their houses on a solid physical foundation. If you watch a a, a house that is built, especially one that's on a slab, there's a lot of work that goes into, and there's a lot of money spent on the slab. Am I right, Brother Bashard? You got to put the money in what's not even going to be seen, right? So that what is seen will be solid. Here's what I discovered. You can tell... When there's no, no, no time, no effort, no prayer being given to the foundation of a relationship by what it looks like on the surface. Because soon it'll begin to crack, soon it'll begin to go away because there, there's not a, found, a firm foundation. So, so if, if you don't, if you got a weak base, it's going to crack. But you got to let God be your foundation. Can I get a witness? Now watch this. Next thing, you make, make note of this. Amen. Uh, protecting a city or family without the Lord results in a weak defense. I like what they were saying, this is how I fight my battle. It looks like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you, God. See, it looks like I'm surrounded by the enemy. It looks like the enemy has the upper hand, but when I got God on my side, amen, when he is He's the one who's keeping me, I don't care what it looks like, God is going to give me the victory. Can I get a witness today? He will give me the victory. Now, guys, we got to have a solid foundation. Can I get a witness? Remember Jesus told a story about two men who built their houses, and one built his house on a rock while the other built his house on on the foundation of sand. Y'all remember the the parable, right? And And so when the storms came, the house that was built on the sand did what? It quickly collapsed. Now, they both looked good. Before the storm came, Tiff, they both looked good, Deborah Faye, before the wind started blowing. But once the storm came, once the wind started blowing, it became very evident which one was built on the right foundation. That's why I say, I don't really know. Hear me carefully. I don't really know where you stand with the Lord. I don't really know how much of this stuff you really believe until you got to go through a storm. I don't know if you really are truly with me until you disagree with me. Amen. I don't really know how much you love me until your love is put to the test. I I, I can say that this woman here loves me because we've been through some some things in 34 years. 34. (laughs) I'm looking for affirmation. 1989. Okay, in December, it, oh, 85, yeah, 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 80, 85, yeah, yeah. Help me, Jesus. Help me, Holy Ghost. Craig, help me. Pray for me, brother. Okay, it was <laughs> 1985, all right? And so in December, it'll be 34 years. And do that, do that, during that 34 years of, of marriage relationship, there's been some ups and downs. Thank God there have been more ups and downs. But we've had to go through some things. We had to we had some challenges we had to face, and, and God has helped us through those things. And through those challenges, I understand more so than ever that this woman loves me. And she understands more so than ever that I love her. I need y'all to I need y'all to listen to me right quick. That person who you call your friend, you don't really know that they're truly your friend until y'all disagree on something. Until you don't just be like a parrot and, and, and repeat everything they say. 
and start challenging them in their walk with the Lord and start challenging them on what's right and what's wrong in their life. Can I get a witness? Remember on last week when we looked at, uh, I think it was last week we talked about how, how, how Paul said to the Corinthian church, he says, it's not our responsibility to judge those in the world, but it is our responsibility to judge those inside of the church, the behaviors that we see in the church. So if I'm in covenant friendship with you as a born-again believer, when I see something that's wrong in you and when you see something that's wrong in me, then we ought to be able to sharpen each other. Can I get a witness? All fathers in the house. Amen. And so many times, brothers in particular don't like to be sharpened by another brother. And even sisters don't like to be sharpened by another sister. So that's why you always gather folk around you who agree with you. And as long as they agree with you, y'all friends. But the moment somebody, amen, calls you out on the carpet for, for your wrong attitude, your wrong behavior, now you don't want to talk to them anymore. See, I don't really know. I don't really know how much you really love me until we have to go through something together. Can I get two witnesses out there? Because the person who you think is with you will turn out to be against you when you're going through some things that, that, that are not necessarily uh, always just pleasant and right, right on the line. But the foundation, amen, has to be established. The, the one that was built on the faulty foundation, amen, when Jesus gave that parable, it, it blew away. Amen. It did not stand the storm. The only foundation that is solid is God and his word, y'all. As that old hymn says, it says, on Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is what? Sinking sand. And so I'm going to build my relationship in the church and outside of the church on the solid foundation of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Everybody say the blessing of fatherhood. All right, so, so, so first of all, we got to, you know, building a family, we got to realize without the Lord results in a weak base. And protecting a family or city without the Lord results in a weak defense. Only he can give true security. Now, I know, uh, how many of y'all ain't got a gun at your house? You ain't got to raise your hand, but how many of you got a gun? All right. <laughs> Nothing wrong with having a gun. Is that Second Amendment right? To possess a firearm. But guess what? You can have a firearm and still not be protected. Right. Nothing wrong with having a gun. All right. But how many of you know there are folk who've had guns who've gotten killed? There are folks who have guns who, 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 who uh, uh, you know, are no longer here. And so the gun itself is not the protection. Now, it's good to have it, but you can't trust in the gun. Oh, y'all don't want to hear that? In other words, you can have it, but you better trust your God. Listen to me carefully. Uh, I believe that uh, sound financial responsibility would dictate and determine that we make sure we watch our monies that come in. We have a budget, that type of thing. But how many of you know you can have a budget, but if you ain't trusting God, your whole budget can be blown with one call, phone call. Amen. Hello? Amen. Some unexpected, that miscellaneous, that stuff that you didn't see coming. Come on. And so now, all of a sudden, you get a phone call or something happens that's going to cost you $10,000 to get it fixed. You can't borrow the money. So where is it going to come from? Now that budget is blown, so I, I better trust God and not the money because money has wings to do what? It'll fly away. Amen. Learn how to trust God. So protecting a city or family without the Lord results in a weak defense. Only he can give true security. Look at Psalms 127 with him one more time. And look at the, the B part of that first verse. The blessing of fatherhood. We're going to get down here. Can we move? Psalms 127, verse 2 says, uh, number one says, the Psalm of Solomon, unless the Lord builds a house, the work of the builders is wasted. Unless the Lord protects a city, guarding it with centuries will do no good. Uh, unless the Lord protects a city. Come on now. Unless the Lord does it, amen, Guarding it with watchmen won't do any good. Because I'm going to tell you something. There's, there's things that happen in life that, that, that all of our planning and all of our strategy won't help us to be prepared for. I'm going to tell you something. Uh, we, you know, let me, let me just tell it like it is. You know, um, when Sister Adams was diagnosed with breast cancer, that was not something that we saw coming. That was not a, a, a challenge we were looking forward to. 
uh, in, in the regimen and have to go through all of the, you know, the stuff that they wear and tear on the body, that's not something we were looking forward to. But you know what? When that thing came, after, after the initial shock and after the initial sudden fear came in, we set our hearts to pray. And we begin to speak and proclaim what God's word says. By his stripes, we claim our healing. By his stripes, we believe that God, this ain't the end of the story, that you got more work to do. And we're going to stand boldly in faith and believe that, that you're going to heal her on this side. Can I get half witness up in here? And you fast forward several months later, then we get a report that says there's no more cancer cells in the body. How many of you know God still can work it out? But listen to me carefully. This stuff we are preaching, we don't know that we really believe it until we got to walk through it. You don't really know that you've got faith until you have to use your faith. And if the Lord would have taken her, I believe without a shadow of a doubt, I would still be speaking and claiming that he is a healer, he is a deliverer, he healed on the other side, and we're going to keep marching on and doing the work of ministry. So can you take it if God's will is different than your will? Some folks lead the church. I thought God was going to heal him, and he didn't heal him. So I'm, I, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm finished. Uh, you know, God ain't fair. Well, let me tell you what I'm going to do. Next time somebody says that, I'm going to dial up Gwen White. And I'm going to let Gwen White tell you how to stand in the midst of the storm. I'm going to let her tell you how, how even though, amen, it, 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 what she prayed for didn't come through on this side, but it came through on the other side, and how, how to keep, keep standing and keep speaking the word of God, even when, I'm, I'm going to give you her number. With her permission. Learning how to stand, even when it don't go the way you want it to go. Amen. I learned how to trust him, and Lou, he will provide. Can I get a witness? I, I, I learned to trust God even in the midst of situations that I don't understand. And I'm not going to understand everything, guys. Here's, here's, here's the, the, the mind-boggling thing about this with, with, with me as I hear people talk. Just because you don't understand it don't mean it ain't real. Because I've seen God do it. And just because you can't figure it out don't mean that God ain't working it out. The Bible says... The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the earth trying to find a man or a woman whom he can show himself strong toward. Amen? There's no other foundation that man can lay than that which is laid by Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so we got to realize that we got to have the proper foundation. But protecting the city of the family without the Lord results in a weak defense. Only he can give true security. The third thing I want you to just make note of in your outline is that, number three, working long, hard hours without the Lord yields no lasting satisfaction. Only he can give true rest and eternal fulfillment. Can I get a witness? See, you think you building, you think you protecting on your own, but, but, but again, uh, uh, it's the Lord. So, 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 so think about this for a second. Because Jerusalem had fallen to a foreign enemy, securing the city was a top priority for the men who brought their families back to the promised land. In fact, they rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem before they focused on building their houses because remember during these period of times uh, that cities, if they didn't have a fortified wall around it, were subject, to, uh, were open to the attack of the enemy. So it was very important that they build, amen, walls around the city, okay? Now again, but, but again, even though you build a wall, even though it's good to have a security system, it's good to have a gun, but don't trust in the security system and the gun to protect you. Trust in God to protect you. Can I get a witness? It's good to have a savings account. It's good to have money put aside for when those rainy days come, when there's an emergency that pops up. We ought to do that. That's wisdom. But don't ever trust in the money because the money can be sucked up. Can I get a witness? The money can go away with any number of emergencies. Uh, anybody who's ever had to go through an extended illness knows that money begins to suck 
to begin to be drawn away by those doctor bills that come in. Can I get two witnesses up in here? And so, so, so even though you had that planted away, trust that God is the one who's going to provide for you. Can I get a witness up in here? So, so Jerusalem uh, was, was a strong, well-protected city when, even when the Babylonian army had invaded because what had happened was the people stopped looking to God and started looking to each other. Trust God to protect you, amen? Do everything you can, amen, humanly possible, but trust that God is the one who's going to protect you and keep you from hurt, harm, and danger. Can I get a witness up here? The Bible says this in 2 Thessalonians 3 and 3, but the Lord is faithful who shall establish you and keep you from evil. It also says this in 2 Timothy 4 and 18, and the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Yes, he will. Amen. So again, let's get to this third point again, working long hours, amen, L working long, hard hours without the Lord yields no lasting satisfaction. I can't tell you the number of times I've talked to people who, who after having careers for 35 and 40 years, regret the fact that they didn't spend enough time with their children. They regret the fact that, that they didn't spend time with their children and they spent all their time working, thinking that work was going to bring fulfillment. I'm here to tell you that work is good, and men ought to work, because if man don't work, y'all not what? So, you sound like that's deep in y'all's spirit, isn't it? If a man won't work, he shouldn't what? All right? If, he, if a man won't work, he shouldn't what? He shouldn't eat, right? So it, it is important to work, but guys, what we got to realize is that, that, that our life consists of more than just building a career. Careers are great. Advance as far as you can, but don't neglect the fact that you got to give time to God and to your family. Can I get a witness up in here? So working long, hard hours without the Lord yields no lasting satisfaction. Only he can give true rest and eternal fulfillment. Look at verse, go back to verse number two of this 1 and 27 number of Psalms. A lot of people working long, hard hours, going to work early, coming home late, working on weekends. And a lot of times, your most your precious priority is your career. Guys, don't do that because I'm here to tell you, uh, uh, when it's all said and done, and y'all know this to be true, when it's all said and done, when you finally retire, you leave there, people are going to cry. They'll give you a gold watch. They're going to tell you they don't know what they're going to do without you. But guess what? They're going to keep doing what they're doing without you. And, and they ain't going to keep up with you like they say they are. We're going to stay in touch. No, they ain't. 99% of them not. Come on. Because it was a work relationship. You only saw them at work. And some of y'all know, some of y'all saw them in the grocery store, and they act like they didn't know who you were. If you get my drip. So, so, so don't, don't, don't be so, I mean, be committed, be faithful, do work hard to the Lord. But what I'm saying is, don't ever mistake the fact that, that work is not all what life is all about. Touch your neighbor and say, hey, relax a little bit. Say, yeah, yeah, say, chill out. Some people are convinced that, they're, that they'll be happy and fulfilled when they achieve a certain goal or advance to a certain level. Uh, or, or, or getting that raise or make a certain amount of money. Yet when they reach that goal, guys, receive that promotion or earn that bonus, they still feel empty inside. That's what Solomon, Solomon felt empty inside, y'all. True satisfaction and fulfillment can be found only in a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. All of us have an empty void that can only be filled by Jesus. Drugs can't fill it. Partying, partying can't fit. That's why, part, you, know, you know, how many of y'all used to love to party? Come on, don't be, you know, let me see, let me see your hand. How many of y'all love, love club scene, party scene? All right. Here's the thing about club scene and party scene. You got to keep doing it over and over and over again. You have a good, good time that Saturday, you got to go back to the next Saturday, right? Friday, uh, okay. Tuesday, latest night. And if you're going out on latest night, Tuesday, you got to go work. Something wrong with you, you know. Okay, now, my point is this, that stuff is fleeting, and it doesn't provide lasting satisfaction. Only Jesus 
and a pure relationship with him, not just coming to church, but having a personal, intimate relationship with Jesus where he's involved in your decisioning, he's involved, he's involved in the planning for your family, your life, he's, 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 he's connected to, to you on a daily basis. Now, I got news for you. You're not really connected to him if you don't spend any prayer time with him, if you don't spend any, any study time with him. You, you're not really connected to him. You don't know what it really means to have that personal relationship. Now, think about your own self. Don't think about anybody else. Ask yourself this question. If, if, if God were to come down right now and examine how much time and how much thought I've given to my relationship with him and where it's going and where it's heading and what he's trying to do in my life, uh, would God be satisfied? Or would you be embarrassed to tell the rest of the church how little time you spend with God in prayer, in silent meditation, in studying the Holy Scripture? Because, see, God is our heavenly Father, and our heavenly Father desires to have intimacy with us. Can I get a witness? So, so when we look at this thing, uh, working, you know, you know, work is... Work hard as unto the Lord. Whatever you do, do hard as unto the Lord. But don't forget to balance that with time with God and time with family. There are many fathers who, who, who regretted not spending time with their, with their children. And as the children have gotten older, that relationship wasn't developed, so there's no, there's no connectivity there. You're looking for the connection. You want to be around, but you didn't, you didn't connect with them when they were growing up. Hello? You didn't spend any time nurturing and develop a nurture. And I, I, I hear some of y'all saying, well, you know, bro, Pastor, it was hard back then, and we just had to work. Listen, you, most of the time, I mean, yeah, you worked hard, but, but working hard, you know, don't mean that you can't spend time with your family. Are you with me today? We got we to gotta pour into our children. And fathers, hear, hear me, fathers, I want you to hear this very carefully. As a matter of fact, go, go, go with me. Uh, look, look what it says here in verse 2. It says, it is useless for you to work so hard from early morning to late at night Anxiously working to, for food to eat, for God gives rest to his loved one. Go to Ephesians, the sixth chapter, right quick, okay? And then uh, we're going we're gonna to begin to take a look at uh, some foundational truths of fatherhood, okay? The fourth thing that we, 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 we put on the don't build your home without the Lord is, is in that Psalm 127 number Psalm, it says that, Children, having children is a gift from God. Now watch this now. Hear me carefully. Having children is a gift from God. That does not mean, man, that you go around planting your seed and having children all across town without having a covenant relationship. Brothers. And some guys, it, 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 it just baffles my mind. They beat the hey, I got nine children. Ain't married to none of the wives and ain't supporting none of them. And then want a gift for father. <laughs> I'm talking about how to do fatherhood the godly way. And let me say this right quick. Hear me carefully. And, and I'm not being critical because God knows I'm, I'm the last one who can, who can afford to do that. But here's what, I, here's what I would tell you. When you, as a man, father a child, Listen to me carefully. And especially now that you say, now maybe when you fathered them, you weren't even saved. You were just doing your thing. You were just dropping your seed across town. But now that you are saved, I think every man has a responsibility to connect with their children. Now, here's a little tricky part. Now, you got to connect with that child, and now, but your current wife is not the mother of that child. Okay, so what happened before you got married shouldn't prevent you from fulfilling God's design for a father. So, that's why it's critically important that husband and wife grow spiritually 
to what you recognize the importance of fatherhood. Guys, I can, I can recount the statistics, and I read them to you almost every year on Father's Day, how when there's not a father in the life of a child, the likelihood of, of life turmoil is so much greater. The likelihood of that child going to jail is so much greater. The like, likelihood of them growing up in poverty is so much greater when dad is not involved in their life. But here you are, lady, mother, wife, saying, um, 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 if you go over there and try to establish a relationship, what it going to look like? What it's going to look like what it is. It, it's his child. Well, I don't want you going over there to her house. Well, see, it sounds like there's some insecurity in y'all's relationship. And that's the right way to do it. He shouldn't be going over there at 11 o'clock at night till I'm going to visit my child. Everybody says there's a dead cat on the line somewhere. I, I just heard some of y'all say, oh, no. No. You didn't say that loud, but you were thinking it. All H E double L no. <laughs> My point is, guys, there is something that God has placed in the institution of fatherhood that needs to be borne out and poured into our children. Are y'all with me? And when our children miss that, there is something intrinsically missing in their life. Look at what he says here in Ephesians, the sixth chapter. You know, doing stuff like, well, you know what? Uh, you, you, you go to a ball game and, and hey, that's my dad over there, but we, I can't say nothing about it. Okay, can we talk? All right, let's do it God's way. Maybe you didn't start out God's way, but now that you say it, we got to do it God's way. Amen? Let's try having children to get from God. Ephesians, the sixth chapter, come on, verse number one. Y'all still tracking with me? Look at what he says, and let's, let's kind of walk through this real gently. He says, children, obey your parents because you belong to the Lord, for this is the right thing to do. It's the right thing to do to obey you. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with the promise. Now, guys, watch this. If you honor your father and mother, things will go well with you, and you will have a long life on earth. Some people say, well, you know, well, I'm not going to honor my dad because he hadn't been in my life. All right, well, let, let me say this. As a child, as a Christian person, uh, you know, you try to establish a relationship. And, and, and I'm, I'm telling you, there's some dads who, who have, have done a poor job of fatherhood because they, they were not taught fatherhood. Here's what I discovered. We tend to model what we see. And if we have not seen that fatherly figure, amen, or have, have not been engaged with having a father who's actually involved in our life, then, then if we're not careful, we'll, 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 we'll probably do the very same thing that we saw growing up. But here's what we're doing at EBC. Now, I'm going to tell you, now, men, if you want to know about manhood, authentic manhood, start coming to our G-Men breakfast. Isn't I right about call? We learned some things. And there's, there's some things that we learned that we didn't know and that we've learned in the last five to six years about authentic manhood, about what it means to be a real man what it means to be a man who pours in your children, what it means to be a man who, who leads your family spiritually, a man who, who, who can pour into your children and rear them up in the nurture and the atmosphere. Lord, we're learning those things. We're learning how to be better husbands. If you'll take it and begin to apply it, I promise you it'll revolutionize all of your relationships. Because the truth be told, some of the images that we saw growing up you know, on TV shows, you didn't see strong dads of African-American descent on a lot of TV shows, did you? I mean, you, you see more so nowadays, but, but you, we didn't see it. And, and first of all, we shouldn't be trying to get our model from TV. Let me, let, me, let me correct that right now. You don't need to learn about fatherhood from TV. Because if you go on TV now, you're going to see a dad and his husband <laughs> trying to rear children. And, and, and Hollywood has interwoven and is trying to make normal what's abnormal. Right. Trying to make, 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 make what's, what's, what's illicit proper. 
And God has a way of doing life. God said, therefore, should a man leave his father and mother and should cleave unto his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And if children are a gift from the Lord, two men can't produce a child and two women can't produce a child. So, I mean, again, I love everybody, and I'm going to minister to everybody. I'm not going to throw, throw darts at anybody, but I'm going to preach truth. And we're going to stand on truth. I mean, guys, we had a young lady one time who was a member of this church, and because of us explaining what the stance is on homosexuality, she decided she couldn't be here because her brother had that lifestyle. And I said, I said, I'm sorry, but this is what the Word of God says. I love you, and if your brother come, I love him. We'll minister to him, but we're going to keep preaching what the Word of God says. Okay? Okay. Well, I got a cousin. Well, I, that's your cousin, but your cousin is wrong. Hello. Okay. All right. Some of y'all trying to get soft in your old age. The Bible is still true. And the natural order of things exposes itself by the natural order. Okay? It's, it's a reason why God did it the way he did it. Now, look at Ephesians right here. If you honor your father and mother, things will go well with you, and you will have a long life on earth. Now, watch this. Look at this. Here's the key thing I, I, I want to get to. Fathers, do not provoke your children. Do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. Okay? Here's what every child is looking for. They're looking for a father who loves them. Now, let me, let me say this right quick. I've said it before and I'll say it again. The example of fatherhood comes from God and his relationship with Jesus Christ, his son. Now, it's hard for us to fathom, how can it be three and one, yet he's father, yet still son? The Bible says great is the mystery of godliness, and how it was that, that God poured out of himself and became born uh, of, 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 of humankind in the manger of Bethlehem. That, that's a great mystery. But the father and son relationship by God the father is an example for us. One of the things I always tell our men in our classes, men, we got to become more vocal in telling our children that we love them. Don't just say, well, they know I love them because I take care of them. No, they need to hear. An example was given to us. You remember when Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River? And, and there's a voice from heaven that, that, that shouted out, said, this is my beloved son in whom I am what? Well pleased. That's God the Father affirming Jesus Christ, the Son, and our children, fathers, need to be affirmed by us. Our children, fathers, need to hear us say, I love you, son. I love you, daughter. I don't care if they're out of the house now. Call them and say, son, I love you. Daughter, I love you. Every time I talk to my children before I hear the phone, I'm going to say, I love you. Son, I love you. I call my son sometimes uh, uh, while he was at school to see what he's doing, and when I hear the phone, I'm going to say, son, I love you. Now, when I used to do that first, he would, he would, you know, he would act like he was kind of, you know, I love you, daddy. <laughs> when his buddies was around. But now that I've done that it, it, over and over again, that's, that's what we're going to do because I'm going to express he needs to hear that his daddy loves him. Now, some of y'all sitting there right now, dads, and you don't tell your children that. Go home today and start doing that. I know you may, your dad may not have done it with you, but you start doing it with your children. Hello, fathers. Okay? Call them. Or if they hear what you, look them in the eye and say, son, I love you. And especially sons need to hear it from their dads. Daughters need to hear it too, but especially sons. Amen? He says, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them Rather, bring them up with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. Now, you can't do this if you don't know what the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord is. Wouldn't that make sense? So here's the problem that we have. is that we have too many fathers in the church saved, born again, going to heaven if they die, but they, don't, they, they can't bring them up with the discipline and an instruction that comes from the Lord because they have not spent any time learning what that is, not learning how fatherhood should be done. Not learning what a real man is. A real man rejects passivity. Is that correct? A real man rejects passivity. A real man, come on, y'all. 
accepts responsibility. A real man leads courageously. A real man invests eternally. And so we got to learn how to, what it means to be a real man. When I was growing up, being a real man or being a, 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 a guy who was a strong man was a man who, who worked hard uh, and, and also he, he could be a ladies' man. You know, they thought that if you were a ladies' man, you know, guys, guys kind of dap you. Yeah, man, you got, yeah, 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 yeah. In the locker, the locker room talk. All right, come on, Jerry Blake, I need you to come out here with me. Come on, Danny Tom, I need you to come out here with me. Y'all trying to leave me out here by myself. Y'all know. Y'all know. <laughs> come on, Danny, Danny say, okay, we wish you, wish you. Back in the day, before we start understanding authentic manhood, back in the day before there was a manpower and, uh, and a promise keepers, uh, men were thought to be, you know, uh, up here if they had a good job, took care of their family, and, okay, somebody said something, or somebody side something or whatever, or either before you were married, you didn't date just one lady, you had two or three ladies. Now, it was fine if you had two or three ladies and you would tell them that, that we dating, there's no serious connection, but you weren't telling them that. You told her, you might, it's me and you only, but you had four or five other over here. And then you go in the locker room and talk about it and thought that made you a man. Guys, let me tell you something. Just because you can lay and play don't make you a man. Can we dispel that rumor and that myth? The days of that is over. I don't care what rap song says, whatever it says. And guys, let me tell you something. I came across a rap song the other day. I'm like, this, this is foul and vulgar. How do our kids listen to this mess? And if they're listening to that mess, it's infiltrating their brain and has them thinking that way. So what, what am I saying? Fathers, men, let's learn how to be God men. Let's learn how to position our lives so that we can pour into our children and leave a lasting legacy a legacy that God will be proud of, a legacy that your wife and, your, and, and even your family will be proud of. Let's learn how to be authentic God men.